My sermon tonight is going to be topical, so it will be different than most sermons I've preached here. And the topic of my sermon is biblical predestination. So let's read Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all, pru- in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom, also ye, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Let's go ahead and pray tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for allowing us to gather here. And uh, dear God, I ask you to help me to preach this message. I pray that it would be easy to understand, and I pray that we would be able to apply it tonight, Lord. um, Please please work through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all can be seated. So this is the most famous passage that teaches predestination. And... As I said, that is the title of my sermon, Biblical Predestination. So predestination is a biblical word. And so we're going to define that tonight. And the word predestination or predestinated appears four times in your Bible. And two times it appears here in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, put a bookmark here and turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. So... If you go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is very popular among independent Baptists, here's the definition for the word predestination. It says, the act of decreeing or foreordaining events, the decree of God by which he hath from eternity unchangeably appointed or determined whatever comes to pass. It is used particularly in theology to denote the preordination of men to everlasting happiness or misery. So what Calvinism teaches is that some people were, before the foundation of the world, ordained to damnation, or they were ordained to one day be saved. And there's no, there's no changing that whatsoever. Now, my first exposure to Calvinism was from one of my friends that I grew up with in high school. And whenever we got to college, he started going to a Calvinist church, and he got exposed to Calvinism and he was trying to persuade me on Calvinism, and one day we had a really big debate about it, and um, unfortunately we, we, we kind of parted ways there. And that's really sad because this was one of my best friends. So Calvinism is something that's very dear to me. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, it rubs me the wrong way. It's dear to me in that sense. <laughs> um, but 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, talking about our more sure word of prophecy, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So this is telling us that we have the word of God. God gave us his word, and it says that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. And I want to define what is a private interpretation. Turn with me to Mark 5, Mark chapter 5. 
So defining private interpretation, let's first define what is an, in, what is an interpretation. And an interpretation in the Bible is what we would call a translation today. Um, for example, you have an interpreter that translates from one language to another. In the Bible, we see the word translation a few times, but it's never talking about language. God translated Saul's kingdom to David, the Bible says. Um, Enoch was raptured up to heaven, and that's called his translation. The Bible word for what we think of as translation with languages is interpret. So Mark 5, look at verse 41. It says, And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel I say unto thee, arise. And so we see here that Jesus spoke in an unknown tongue, and, he, and there, the Bible interprets it into what's clear and easy to be understood, um, an understood language. Look at Mark 15 and verse 34. Mark 15 and verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Turn to 1 Corinthians 14. So we see here that Jesus was speaking again in a, in a language that the, the Bible's written in Greek, and so he's speaking in another language, and it's being interpreted, it's, it's being translated. Now, I just want to make this point real quick, that the modern Bible people say that there's no such thing as a perfect translation, right? That's one of their biggest things, is there's no such thing as a perfect translation. However... There's perfect translations right here within the Word of God. We just read two of them. Perfect translation. Talithi kumai means damsel I send to thee arise. That's a perfect translation. And um, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. We have the Word of God right here in the King James Bible. Right. It's the perfect translation from Hebrew and Greek into English. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 27. Look down at your Bible. It says, If any man speak in an unknown tongue... Let it be by two, or at most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So right there, you know, when you walk into a Pentecostal church and you've got ten people standing up blabbing, um, it says that at the most two or by three, and that by course, and obviously we know what they're blabbing is not what the Bible's talking about, an unknown tongue. It's talking about a language that we wouldn't understand, an actual language, not just gibberish. But it goes on to say, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So interpretation is simply translating, what we would think of as translating. We also see Joseph in the Old Testament, whenever Pharaoh had his dream that troubled him because he could not understand what it meant, Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God. And then what did he do? He went on to take what was mysterious and hard to be understood, and he Put it into words easy to be understood. He, he interpreted the dream. Another example of a mystery is Jesus' parables. Okay? Jesus spoke what was hard to be understood and what was easily misinterpreted in the ears of all the people. And then he would go away privately with his disciples and he would give the interpretation. He'd make the parable easy to be understood. He'd explain exactly what each element of the parable means. Now... A proper interpretation is letting Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, define what the Bible's saying. <laughs> a proper interpretation is letting Jesus define what the Bible's saying. The Bible says we need to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And so what I believe that means is that we need to take the Bible and instead of just going to a, a dictionary first, we need to look at what the Bible says about itself. How, how does the Bible interpret itself? Um, now, a private interpretation would be taking Jesus' parable, for example, about the sower and the seed, and looking at all the different elements and coming up with what you think that it means, and just ignoring where Jesus clearly laid out, here's what the good ground is, here's what the stony ground is, here's what the thorny ground is. And um, a private interpretation is just ignoring that and just making up your own interpretation. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, Calvinism creates a private interpretation not found in the Bible. And it's like trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Instead of finding what the Bible definition is, they take John Calvin's definition, 
and shove that square peg into the Bible. Now we're going to come back to Ephesians chapter 1 at the end, but I want you to underline or circle or highlight, make a note, do something in your Bible with these words. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, in Christ. Verse 4 says, in him. Verse 6 says, in the beloved. Verse 7 says, in whom. Verse 9 says, in himself. Verse 10 says, in Christ and in him. This is not how the whole Bible is written. It's not just saying, in him, in him, in him. There's something being emphasized in this chapter. And what's being emphasized is Jesus Christ, not you and me. And we're going to get back to that idea. But turn with me to Romans chapter 3. So Calvinism, I want to first define Calvinism. And Calvinism has these five tenets that is summed up in this acronym called TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. And each of, those, um, each of those letters stands for one of the main tenets of Calvinism. And the first, the first tenet is the T, which stands for total depravity. Total depravity. And so what total depravity teaches is that all men are born into sin, which we agree with. Um, David said, I was shaping in iniquity. But, just as a side note, John Calvin taught that babies that are not baptized, babies that do not come from saved parents and then gets baptized, that those babies are going to hell. We don't believe that. The Bible definitely teaches an age of accountability. That is a biblical concept. But total depravity says that we're all born into sin, and this is true. But it goes way beyond what the Bible says, and it says that we are so depraved that we are unable to believe the gospel. Total depravity teaches that if I take the Bible to someone that's unsaved and someone that is not chosen before the foundation of the world to be saved, and I show them the gospel, even if they understand it, they cannot believe. And that is completely unbiblical. Romans 3 verse 9 it says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Before we get saved, we are depraved. We are wicked and fallen in sin. We're lost. But look at verse 19. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, whatever the law says, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The purpose of the law is to point out that we are all guilty. Now, how does it reason, if we are all guilty before God because we've broken his commandments, how does it reason that we are guilty if we had no capacity, no ability to believe the gospel, to follow the Bible, to keep God's commandments after we're saved? How does that reason? It doesn't reason. It's illogical. Calvinism, though, teaches that the unsaved are condemned from birth, and they are totally depraved and have no ability. And yet it says here that the, the whole purpose of God even giving the law was to show us our guiltiness. Now, <clears throat> one side note about total depravity, Jesus did say that no man can come unto the Father except the Holy Spirit draw him. Right. However, Jesus also said in John chapter three, just like the serpent on the pole with Moses in the wilderness, if he's lifted up, he's going to draw all men to himself. Jesus Christ draws all men to himself. Amen. Now, as another side note, look at verse 24. It says being justified freely by his grace through the re through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. 
By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Notice again, just like in Ephesians 1, the emphasis is on Jesus Christ and his righteousness, not on us. And it says, where is boasting? However, Calvinism and a lot of the Calvinists that I've talked to and interacted with, they put the emphasis on themselves. They put the emphasis saying, I am one of the elect. I was born before the foundation of the world. Nobody else was. Or not nobody else, but the vast majority, 90% of the world was not chosen like I was. And that causes boasting. But Jesus Christ gets all the glory. He wants no boasting. Look at Acts 17 and verse 30. Acts 17, verse 30 says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. God commandeth every man everywhere to repent, but the Calvinist God, the Calvinist God gives commands to all men everywhere to repent whenever they don't even have the ability to do that. God, the Calvinist God, gives commands that nobody can keep. And this is ridiculous. The Bible says God's commandments are not grievous. Turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. So the first tenet of Calvinism is total depravity. And the next tenet is unconditional election. Unconditional election. Unconditional election is, as I've said, says that before the foundation of the world, before anything was created, God sat down and, and he thought of every single person that would ever come into existence. And he said, I'm going to choose y'all to be saved, and I'm going to choose the rest of y'all to go to hell. And there's absolutely no crossover. There's absolutely no way for anything to change. The elect, as they call it, the elect is going to be saved. And um, we know that reprobates, according to the Bible, are those who reject the gospel and then they become reprobate. Nobody's born a reprobate. But Calvinism defines reprobate as those people who were chosen before the foundation of the world to go to hell. And this is unconditional election. Um, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That's conditional. It's conditioned on believing on Jesus Christ. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That is conditional. So Calvinists twist the word predestination, and they also twist the word elect. Okay, Elect is a word that has been abused through private interpretation. And as I said, the Calvinists define elect as all of the saved. And this is a partial truth because all of the saved are elect, but elect is not talking about salvation. Election in the Bible is not salvation. Election in the Bible is service after you're saved. It's about the works that you do after you're saved. Every single saved person is elect to some office, but nobody is elected to salvation. Look at Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. This is the first time elect appears in your Bible. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flats shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. This is talking about Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is called God's elect. And Jesus Christ was not chosen before the foundation of the world for salvation. FYI, Jesus Christ, though, was God's servant. And that's what it means whenever it says that Jesus is God's elect. Turn to Isaiah 65. Now, whenever you have an election in America, are you elected to become a citizen? Are we voting to make somebody a citizen of the United States? No. 
We're electing someone to be a puppet of the New World Order. <laughs> Excuse me, I mean, we elect someone to be a public servant in a public office. And uh, <laughs> election in the Bible, you're not being elected to become a citizen of heaven. You're being elected to a specific service in the body of Christ. Look at Isaiah 65 and verse 9. It says, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell therein. So we see here that the Bible is using two interchangeable words, elect and servants. Look at uh, verse 22. It says, They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Here again, we see the word elect coupled with the word work. It's about service. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to have you all flipping tonight. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So far, is this talking to saved people or unsaved people? It's clearly talking to saved people, right? Now look at verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's saying, hey, now that you're saved, work for God so that you can have an inheritance when you get to heaven. Now, is he saying here, give diligence to make your salvation sure? No. Now, that's said elsewhere in the Bible. But right here, that's not the context at all. He's talking to people who know they're saved. And he's telling them to work now that you're saved. Make the office that God has called you to, sure. Make sure that you're in the right place, serving where God wants you, so that you can be storing up the most rewards in heaven. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1. Flip to the left, just a few pages, to 1 Thessalonians 1. And here we see the exact same thing. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Is he talking about their salvation? No, he's talking about their labor of love, their work of faith, their patience of hope. He's talking about their service in Christ Jesus. They were saved, and then they were elected. Paul's reminding them of their labor and asks them to remember their election. Go to Romans chapter 9. And this is one of the, fa <laughs> Excuse me. This is one of the favorite passages of Calvinism. Verse 11 particularly is one of their favorite verses. Um, of course, it's not their favorite because of what it actually says, but it's their favorite because of their private interpretation. Romans chapter 9, look at verse 6. It says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So he's talking here about Isaac's children, Jacob and Esau. And what he's doing is he's making a spiritual connection that those who are saved are Jacob and those who are unsaved are Esau. Now look at verse 9. 
For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Jacob, excuse me, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So what Calvinism does is they look at this verse 11 and they say, see right there, before the, these children were even born, God elected for Jacob to be saved and Esau to be damned. Is that what it says? No. Now, we're, I'm going I'm to spoil where we're going, but this is talking about nations. This is talking about how Jacob would bring forth Israel, Esau would bring forth Edom, and it's saying that Edom was going to serve Israel. It's not talking about salvation whatsoever. And this is talking about election of nations to service, not salvation. Look at Genesis 25. Hold your place here in Romans 9. Go to Genesis 25. Genesis 25 and verse 23 is what's being quoted in Romans chapter 9. It says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Does this sound like salvation? Absolutely not. Keep your place here. Romans 9 verse 13 said, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And so is this saying that Esau was hated from the womb? Is this saying that God just chose Esau to damnation and he hated him from the womb? That's not what it's saying. Esau was a wicked man. He was not hated as an unborn child. He was hated because he went on to become a wicked man. Look at Genesis 25 and verse 34. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way, Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau despised, Esau hated what God had given him, which was his birthright. This is wicked. Look at uh, Genesis 27 and verse 41. It says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. Esau was not a righteous man, and that is why he was hated. Go to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. If you know where Matthew is, it's the book right before Ma uh, Matthew. Malachi chapter 1. And this is also quoted there in Romans chapter 9. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 1 says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountain and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, so it's talking about Esau, now it's talking about Edom, because Edom and Esau are used interchangeably. Edom is talking about the nation that came forth from Esau. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus, thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Esau was hated because Esau was unrighteous. I hope that's abundantly clear. He was not chosen from the womb for this. Okay, go back to Romans 9 and look at verse 14. Romans 9, 14 says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. But the, Okay, just, just pause real quick. The Calvinists take this and they say, God is choosing some people to have mercy by showing them the way of salvation, by, by um, forcing them to be saved. And God's hardening others by forcing them to be damned. Look at verse, um, verse 17. For
For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he, hath, he will have mercy, and on whom he will he hardeneth. Flip back to Exodus chapter 7. This is talking about Pharaoh being hardened. So let's look at what it says about Pharaoh being hardened. Exodus chapter 7. Verse 13, Exodus seven thirteen says, And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, he refuseth to let the people go. So we see that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but at the same time God said, Pharaoh is refusing. Look at, look at Exodus eight fifteen. Exodus eight fifteen says, but when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Then look down at verse 32. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. We see here, God is hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh is hardening his own heart. Look at chapter 9 and verse 12. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Verse 34, and when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart. We see it going back and forth between God hardening Pharaoh and Pharaoh hardening himself. God hardening Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardening himself. It says, and he hardened his heart and his, and his servants, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would, he let the people of chil neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Now look at the next verse, chapter 10, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. What did, what did 934 say? It said, Pharaoh hardened his heart, he and his servants. And then it says in the next chapter that, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and his servants. So what we see here is that in the Bible, whenever someone rejects God, God will give them over to a reprobate mind. Whenever someone rejects God, God will begin to reject them. And that's what we see played out with Pharaoh. That is what's being emphasized here. He was not born a reprobate. He was elected to this office as the king of Egypt because God knew that he had already hardened his heart and that he would just continue hardening his heart. Go back to Romans 9. Romans chapter 9 and verse 19. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? This sounds like a question that a Calvinist would ask. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory even us whom he hath called not of the jews only but also of the gentiles and so we see here that paul is saying he's talking about nations he's talking about jews and gentiles here he's not talking about individuals just to reinforce this go to jeremiah 18 Let's look at what Paul is quoting. Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah 18 and verse 1 says, The word which came to, to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came, up, came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Is he talking about individuals? Is the pot that God is, is molding here, is this individuals? being molded for salvation. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation 
and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and pull down and to destroy it. Look at what verse 8 says. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. And so we see here that the, the, the potter, the, excuse me, the pot has the choice to repent or to turn to evil. And God is going to fashion that pot according to the choice of that pot. And so what we see is Romans chapter 9 is talking about those who reject God become predestinated for hell by becoming reprobates. Now turn with me to John 15. So that's the word elect. And I believe elect is talking about service. Now the word chosen goes hand in hand with the word elect. And again, Ephesians 1 says that God has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Does that mean that he chose us to salvation? Look at John 15 and verse 16. It says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it you. He may give it you. Jesus is saying that he chose the 12 disciples to salvation? No. He chose the 12 disciples to bring forth fruit. He chose the 12 disciples to serve him. He chose the 12 disciples to labor for salvation, for souls to be saved, not for salvation. Excuse me. <laughs> Go to Acts 9. Acts 9. Acts 9 is talking about Paul's conversion. And this was actually before Paul got saved. It says in Acts 9, verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, talking about Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So we see here that Paul was actually chosen before salvation. But is this saying that Paul was chosen to salvation? No, it's saying that he was chosen to bear the name of Jesus Christ before the Gentiles. Paul was chosen to preach salvation to the Gentiles. God chose Paul for that mission. But if Paul had refused the gift of salvation, if Paul had hardened his heart and not been saved, God, I'm sure, had somebody chosen to go in as second string so that they could go send the gospel to the Gentiles. Go to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians 1 and verse 27 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. This is talking about preachers. God is choosing preachers of the gospel. And it says that he's chosen them. Is he choosing these preachers to salvation? No, he's choosing them to serve him. And so what, it, what is a private interpretation is grabbing, when we're talking about salvation, a private interpretation is grabbing verses about doing works after you're saved and dragging those verses back to try to talk about salvation. It's misapplying verses that aren't talking about salvation and trying to apply those to salvation. Now, Calvinism does the exact same thing by grabbing these words elect and chosen, which are about works after you're saved, dragging them back to talking about salvation. 2 Timothy 2.4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he, hath, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Once you are saved, you are chosen by God for a service. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2.
The next petal of this dead tulip is limited atonement. Limited atonement. And I think that this one is extremely blasphemous. Limited atonement says that Jesus Christ did not die for the entire world. Jesus Christ did not shed his blood for the entire world. He only shed his blood for the elect. And those, that group of people that Calvinists call reprobate, the group of people that will never be saved, Jesus never died for them. Jesus only died for these people over here. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus Christ died for every man. And there was a Calvinist preacher that tried persuading me. He, um, he crept into my parents' church, and he, he got me alone one day, and he was trying to persuade me on Calvinism. Little did he know that I knew my Bible, and I knew exactly what Calvinism is. So um, when he started trying to shove Calvinism down my throat, I turned right here. And I said, well, what do you say about this? It says, that, that it says God will have all men to be saved. That's God's will. You know what he said? He said, well, if you look at verse 1, it says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and givings of thanks be made for all men. You know what he said to me? He said, you don't pray for each and every individual, do you? You don't get down on your knees and pray for each and every man. What this is saying is all types of men. You pray for all types of men. You pray for red, yellow, black, and brown. And that's what it's saying is that Jesus died for red, yellow, black, and brown. But he didn't die for every man. This is wicked. This is disgusting how they're twisting scripture. You know what I have written down on my prayer list at home? I pray for all men and for kings and all that be in authority that they might be saved. Just in spite of him. <laughs> Go to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. 2 Peter chapter 1, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Are these people saved? They're bringing in damnable heresies. They're preaching a false gospel. They are not saved. It says, even denying the Lord that bought them and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Jesus Christ bought false prophets. Jesus Christ bought the reprobates that are going to hell right. because they were not always reprobate. Right. God gives every single person a chance to be saved because God's will is that all men be saved. John 1 29, John said about Jesus, behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. Turn with me to Acts 7. The next tenet of Calvinism in their acronym, TULIP, is irresistible grace. Now, irresistible grace, the way that Calvinists teach this is that, you know what? God, God loved the elect so much that before the foundation of the world, he sat down and he chose you to salvation. And, you know, you were born totally depraved. And because of your total depravity, you were so gone, you were so far wicked that you couldn't even believe. And, you know, whenever God finally showed up to you because you're elect, God showed his grace to you. And whenever that Holy Spirit came and knocked on your door, you just, anybody that experiences the grace of God just cannot reject it. 
Nobody can resist the grace of God. Now, this sounds pretty lovey-dovey, but look at Acts 7.51. It says, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. And so what we see here is that Calvinism is all about philosophy. Calvinism is all about having these lovey-dovey talking points, what sounds good, what tickles the ears, but when you compare it to the scripture, it is completely contrary. The Bible says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Bane philosophy breeds private interpretation that's completely contrary to Scripture. There's no need to go any further with irresistible grace than Acts 7.51. The unsaved hypocrites that murdered Stephen resisted the Holy Ghost. They resisted the grace of God. How about that? And then the next tenet of Calvinism is perseverance of the saints, also known as works-based damnation. Go to Romans chapter 4. Calvinism teaches that anyone who's predestinated to be saved, anyone who's one of those elect, they are going to do the works to the end of their life to show, to prove that they're truly saved. And this is just works-based damnation wrapped up in a pretty bow. Romans 4 verse 3 says... For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. By simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, I receive his righteousness. And whenever I get saved, the Bible says that the word of God cuts asunder my flesh and my spirit. The old man and the new man are separated. The old man is the body of flesh born into sin that is totally depraved. And the new man is that spiritual creature born after the image of Christ Jesus, created after the image of Christ Jesus. And the Bible says, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin because his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And you know how I apply that? My new man is completely incapable of sinning. And yet not a single Calvinist or Lordshipper or repent of your sins heretic is going to say that. I cannot sin because they're carnal. They're fleshly. They're not born of God. They're focused on the physical. They're focused on the flesh. The only people who preach that are sinless perfectionists, and the Bible tells us they're liars. Okay, so the Calvinist definition of predestination comes from the the two doctrines of unconditional election and his irresistible grace. They kind of go hand in hand. Because God has predestinated us to be saved, we're going to get saved one way or the other. And it doesn't have anything to do with your free will. Now, there's two views of predestination. And the first view says that this only applies to salvation. You know, we're only um, chosen to salvation or we're only chosen to, to damnation. The other view of predestination says that every single act of life is predetermined. Every single act in life is predestined. predestined. Um, <clears throat> you know, I slept in till 1030 today and I missed work because it's not because I'm a lazy bum. It's because I was predestinated to do that. <laughs> this is taking Calvinism to its logical conclusion. It's, it's foolishness. Go to 1 Samuel 23. Let's see what the Bible says about this. First Samuel 23 and verse 7 says, And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into my hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. So Saul hears that David's hiding out in the city of Keilah, which is walled. And he's like, we're going to march right into the gate. And we got him. We, we got him trapped. Verse 9 says, And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, 
Thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Listen here. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Verse 12. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbore to go forth. Was David delivered up into the hands of Saul? No. David departed out of Keilah and he was never delivered up. So God said, you're going to be delivered up. But David used his free will to walk out of the city and he was safe. God did not create robots. God did not allow sin to enter into the world so he could have this puppet show. God allowed sin to prove who wants to believe him, who wants to love God. And this doctrine of predestination has crept into even fundamental Baptist circles. And there's plenty of IFB churches that preach the exact same thing on predestination as the Presbyterian church down the street. And so we now have a def- description of what is Calvinism. And the way that Calvinists are, are classified is, is you, you would say a five-point Calvinist believes all five of those points of tulip. Okay? And a five-point Calvinist is not saved. Because if you believe in limited atonement, you believe in a false Christ that did not die to shed his blood for all the world. And if you believe in perseverance of the saints, you believe in works-based salvation, which is a false gospel. Beyond those two points of Calvinism, there is room for disagreement. There's plenty of three-point Calvinists and one-point Calvinists that are brethren that love the world. But I'm standing here to tell y'all, I am a zero-point Calvinist. And I'm proud of that. I was predestinated before the foundation of the world not to be a Calvinist. Turn to Romans 8. Ephesians 1 has two of the four mentions of the word predestination, and the other two are found in Romans chapter 8. <coughs> Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. It says, and we, excuse me, hold on. Yes. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Does this say that we were predestinated to believe on Jesus Christ? not what it says, but that's exactly how Calvinism teaches it. It says, according to God's foreknowledge, we were predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, before I believed on Jesus Christ, my destination was not to be conformed to the image of Christ. God knew what would happen. He foreknew that, but that was not my destination until the moment that I believed. And foreknowledge and predestination, a lot of people, I I talked with some people recently that said that foreknowledge and predestination are the exact same thing. But this is not true. The way I look at predestination, what the Bible's saying here, is that there's a fork in the road. I'm walking along and I I land on this fork. and, And this fork is salvation. I can believe on Jesus Christ or I can reject Christ. And what I believe that God's foreknowledge He knows what's going to happen if I reject Christ, and he knows what's going to happen if I believe on Christ. And you know what? Even beyond that, every single choice, every single thought in my life, I've got plenty of forks in the road, right? Every single single choice I have, God has given me a free will where I can choose whatever fork. And I believe God's foreknowledge is so immense that he knows every single possibility of every single one of those forks. And it all lines up with his will. That glorifies God. 
saying that God chose some people to salvation and some people to be damned does not glorify God. Another point I want to make, and this is, this is a pretty big point, is that the word is predestination. Now, I've actually never heard a Calvinist say that word correctly their, their first time saying it to me. They always say predestined. Oh, I was predestined before the foundation world. But what's the difference? Destined, predestined has the, word, has the root word destiny. And this is, again, Calvinism is all about this weird philosophy. And I think this is where the whole idea of destiny comes from. You know, it was my destiny to be saved. It was my destiny for this to happen. But that's not what the Bible says. It says predestinated. And what does that mean? The root word of that is destination. My destination is heaven. I believed on Jesus Christ. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven one day, but I'm not there yet. So heaven is, I'm predestinated for heaven. My destination is heaven. Go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The Bible says he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. This does not say that we were chosen before the foundation of the world. That's how Calvinism reads it. But this says we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. What I believe that Ephesians 1, verse 4 is saying is that before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ was chosen by God to be the vehicle of salvation. And everyone that gets on that bus, by believing on Jesus Christ, their destination is heaven. But we're not there yet, so we're predestinated for heaven. God did not predestinate us before the foundation of the world. All who come to Christ are predestinated the moment that they believe. My destination was hell before I got saved. That's what it saved means. Why would the Bible say that I'm saved if I was never in danger? If my destination was never hell, then I'm not saved. I was saved from something, and it wasn't just being saved from my sins. I was saved from hell. And the moment that I believed, my destination changed from hell to heaven. To really bring this point home, turn with me to Romans 16 and verse 7. And I'd recommend writing this verse in the margin of your Bible next to Ephesians 1.4. Because it's going to help you understand what's being said. Romans 16, verse 7. <clears throat> it says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Paul said, before I got saved, my brethren over here, they were in Christ. Now what Calvinism says is that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, meaning that we were in Christ before we were even born. That's not what the Bible says. We got in Christ the moment that we believed. The moment that we believed, we were predestinated by getting on, by getting in Christ. Now, the Calvinist definition of predestination is a complete lie, and this should change your perspective on soul winning. We have a duty. I was told that I have the wrong motive for soul winning because I, I, I want to see souls saved. I was told that because I believe that if I don't go soul winning, there will be people going to hell that would not go to hell if I was out preaching the gospel. I was told that that is the wrong perspective. That's the wrong motive. The real motive is I need to just want rewards and I want God to show his power through me by, by um, exercising my lack of free will through me. <laughs> this just doesn't make sense. No, there are souls going to hell and I must go and preach the gospel. Paul said, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Brother Jose preached about Cornelius, and I want to go back to that story. 
Acts chapter 10, I'm going to be in verse 1, uh, I'm going to start reading. It says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band that is called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his, ha- with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. I'm in verse 4. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. We see an unsaved man, Cornelius, that fears God. He's a devout man. He's praying. He's fasting. And what does God do? God shows up and he says, go find Paul. I'm, I'm sorry, go find Peter. Go find that soul winner. Look at, um, look at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now he's talking about Cornelius, who at this point is still unsaved. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Cornelius was a devout man that feared God, and so God sent him a soul winner. Look at Acts 8. Flip back to Acts 8. We see the same thing with the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 8, verse 26 says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way which, that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Um, look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Here we see the Ethiopian eunuch. He was going to Jerusalem to worship as a Gentile. He was reading the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah while he was returning. This was another man that feared God. And what did God do? God said, Philip, go join yourself to that chariot. Go knock on that man's door and preach the gospel to him. So there are people that are seeking God and God sees them and he doesn't say, oh no, how are they ever going to get saved? He's in the middle of the jungle. How's he going to hear the gospel? He sees to it that a soul winner is going to come to anyone that wants the truth, to anyone that's seeking the truth. And we knock on the door of people all the time that get saved And they say, hey, I've been praying for the truth. I've been praying. I've been asking God, please get me in a good church. I've been praying. I've been asking God. I want to know the truth. I want to know how to be saved. Now, on the flip side, your average Joe that we knock on the door of, they're not that way. (laughs) They don't give God a second thought. And yet, there's a lot of average Joes out there like that, that whenever they hear the gospel, they believe and they get saved. And I believe that if, if I was to stop preaching the gospel, if this church was to stop preaching the gospel, I believe those people who are Cornelius's and Ethiopian eunuchs, I believe God's going to send someone from somewhere else to knock on their door and they're going to get saved. But I believe that those average Joes who aren't seeking God, they will die and go to hell if we do not knock on their door. Yeah. We have a duty to preach the gospel. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. We need to reject the carnal philosophy of Calvinism and realize we have a duty in life. And that is to preach the gospel to every creature because if they do not hear, they will go to hell. Paul was no Calvinist. You say, oh, the job will get done one way or the other. Somebody else will do it. No, God told you to go do it. God told you to go preach the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians uh, 4 verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them which are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest, that means unless, 
lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If we don't preach the gospel, they're not going to see the light. We need to get off the couch and go preach the gospel. We also need to reject the carnal philosophy that Calvinism puts in our daily life as a Christian. Even if you think predestination is ridiculous, it's easy to get this complacent mindset in the Christian life that says, well, God made me just the way I am. There's no need to push myself or try any harder. I'm okay. I'm good. I'm happy where I'm at. It's lukewarm to say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. God has unlimited potential in your life. And what you get out is what you put in. We have a free will to serve God as much as we want or as little as we want. And we need to use our free will to be the best Christians that we can possibly be, not be lukewarm.